I am really excited to be here and talk to you guys, uh, talk to a room full of people who are interested in data to talk to you about even more data. Um, I used to run the in innovation team at AOL. And as Jeremy said, I'm now CEO and founder of My Planet, which is a technology startup that's helping to fuel the internet of you. And today, I'm going to be speaking to you about the future of the internet and how it's going to be all about you. So there was this great article in Newsweek that said, we are entering an age of personal big data, and its impact on our lives is going to surpass that of the internet. Now, think about the impact that the internet has had on your life, how you dealt with things before the internet, and how you deal with those same things now, like how you used to have to mail every letter before you could email it, or deal with paper maps, or how the only videos you could watch were on a VCR, or how you had to actually pick up the phone and call people to wish them happy birthday before you could type HB on Facebook, HB, HB, HB. Now, imagine something that has the potential to transform your life in even greater ways. We are on the cusp of that transformation right now, and it's a transformation that's been in the works for almost half a century. Every 20 years or so, our lives are revolutionized by a powerful technology that moves from the realms of large enterprises into the hands of the consumers. In the 70s, it was computing. We went from mainframe computers behind glass enclosed cages to personal computers on the desktop. In 1975, there were 50,000 PCs globally. Today, there are over 2 billion and there are over 4 billion smartphones. Now, I started coding when I was 11 years old on a Radio Shack TRS-80. I'm going to ask, how many of you guys remember those days? Raise your hand. Yeah. Scary, right? Its hard drive held a whopping 4 kilobytes of data, which is larger. Which A single digital photo day is larger than that. The next transition was networking. What was once used by science labs of the military became available to all of us with the World Wide Web. In 1995, there were 16 million internet users. Today, there are over 3 billion internet users. And get this, there will be more internet traffic in 2017 than in all prior internet years combined. Now, to say that it is hard to imagine life for most of the world without constant access to computing and networking would be an understatement. The 2010s is the next transition, and it is the coming out party for data. Up until now, the ability to access, assemble, and glean insights from vast and deep data has been locked inside enterprises and the government. They've been crunching data about you and their businesses to improve their operations, maximize their profits, and gain a competitive edge. Today, the big data business is a $300 billion a year industry, and it employs over 3 million people in the United States alone. Just to give you an example of one of the benefits of big data, FedEx reconfigured its entire logistical system by tracking where and how long it took each and every package to move through its system. By doing so, it was able to find and eliminate bottlenecks. So success came from capturing, processing, and analyzing vast amounts of data, granular level data. Now you will have the ability to capture, process, and analyze your data. Your data will answer questions you could never before answer. Everyday questions like, who was that potential buyer or client you met at a, at a cocktail party? Important questions like, precisely how long can you expect to live? And truly profound questions like, does that outfit actually make you look fat? <laughs> your data will have the ability to answer, oh, so um, your data also will have the ability to anticipate and predict your every desire, delivering you services, information, advice, and offers before you even ask. This is the promise of the Internet of You. Now, does that sound scary to some people? Yeah. But powerful, right? And exciting. So why is this happening now? 
Well, an exploding number of connected devices are capturing new kinds of information about our everyday actions and habits. Devices like your smartphone, or wearables like the Fitbit and Apple Watch, home devices like the Nest thermostat and smart TVs. Think about your smartphone. It is capturing data about your real world experiences through your own input and through device sensors like the GPS, accelerometer, light meter, and motion sensors. So you are consciously and unconsciously creating data constantly. In fact, your digital footprint captures almost every aspect of your real world life. Just think about the data you create from the minute you wake up. There's a time and location of when your alarm went off, how many times you press snooze, your morning meditation, the emails and social media posts you read and send before you head into work, your Uber car ride, easy pass scan, your Starbucks daily purchase, and it's not even 9 a.m. yet. There's the prescription you fill via your pharmacy app, the number of steps you took, your heart rate, your online purchases, your exits and entrance from offline purchases. There's these things we call stores. There's your texts, there's your phone calls, there's the media you consume via YouTube, Hulu, your Netflix account, your smart TV. Seriously, I haven't even mentioned the photos you've posted of your new haircut, your smoothie, or your cats. How many of you, raise your hands if you've ever thought about the actual amount of personal data you create. Raise your hands if you haven't thought about it. Okay, raise your hand if you haven't raised your hand, because there's a large amount of you. All this data paints a vivid picture of our daily activities and our habits our motivations and purchasing desires. It is a complete stream of information, and it is all about you. As each day, month, and year passes, the amount of data that we are creating grows and grows to unimaginable volumes. All this data, the small personal data when aggregated, is personal big data. Now, some people like to say little data or small data. It's all the same thing. It's about the vast amount of data about an individual. So I am not the only one to have noticed that our data has grown to epic proportions. In fact, the World Economic Forum has also noticed its explosive growth, so much so that they have said that personal data is the asset class of the 21st century. And users, users should essentially view it like money in the bank. So being able to leverage personal big data is the whole, in deep and meaningful ways, is the holy grail to the internet of you. So exactly how do we do that? Well, the game changer ushering in this new era of personal big data is the ability to make sense of data in ways that lets non-tech humans, the average Joe, interact with it, use it, and learn from it. So what is literally the best way for us humans to make sense of our data? Well, let's look at how our brains have been doing it for eons. Our brains have evolved over two million years to process data about our real world activities based on our physical, real world environment. So your body, or dismembered head, is always at some location, let's call that the where, you're always at some point in time, that's the when, you're always doing something, like drinking, that's the what, and you're always with, and you may be with somebody else, that's the who. Now, the hippocampus, part of our brain, contextualizes, connects this who, what, when, and where to recreate context. The hippocampus is responsible for short to long-term memory, which is the memory responsible for personally experienced events, which is a moment, that was a moment in time that we saw before, which is a moment in time and place. So you wouldn't remember where your home was or how to get back to this conference room if it wasn't for the hippocampus. Now here's the problem. While our brains contextualize each moment of our real world lives by connecting who, what, when, and where, in our digital lives, all this data is disconnected. So how did this happen? Well, we had paper silos. We had calendars, which had our events or our when. No joke, my mom still has the Norman Rockwell flip calendar in her, her refrigerator. 
Um, we had yellow pages and maps which had our places or our wares. We had little black books which had our contacts or our people or whose. And we had scrapbooks and photo albums and notepads which had our content or our what. These paper silos could only manage one type of data because that's all they were physically constrained to do. Now the problem is that technologists did not think about it. They took these paper silos and when digital, when computers came along, they made exact replicas of those silos and put them on the computer. And then when smartphones came along, they plot analogs of that onto the smartphone. So how does this look digitally today in our lives? Well, a single moment of life is recorded across various applications. So let's say you're at dinner with a client and you have a great bottle of wine. Your client's information is in your contacts. That dinner event is in your calendar. That restaurant is in an email or a four square check-in. And that bottle of wine, that photo, is now stranded in your camera or your photos application. None of those applications talk to each other. They don't work together. You open up each one separately, record some data in it, close it, and then that application stores that data in its own format for its own later use. The result is that none of your apps have a holistic view of you, the user. Now, very little data is valuable in a standalone format. It, it, it needs the context in order to provide a dimension that gives meaning to the data that otherwise may not be clear. So you may say that housing prices are valuable in a standalone context, but even housing prices need the dimension of time. Was the price yesterday, three years ago, or 30 years ago? And location, is that home on Fifth Avenue in Manhattan or in a rural town in North Dakota? So the contextualized experience is the key to relevance, and relevance is what it's all about. Relevance is going to give you the best insight into understanding your life from your data. So the contextualized experience is what's going to drive the relevance of the experiences on the internet of you, whether that's a customized offer, a personalized service, or some predictive advice that is tailored to just your life. There are two quotes that I love. One is from Gary Vaynerchuk, who's a famous digital marketer. And he said, if content is king, then context is God. And then there's a quote from a VP of digital marketing at Adobe, who said, a world in which tens of thousands of apps and devices are added to the internet every second is only valuable to me if those apps and devices are working together and learning about my life to create experiences I need. Consumers don't want an internet of a thousand apps and devices with disparate content. They want an internet of me. So the internet of you must be driven by an intelligent, centralized layer like our brains that connect and contextualize all the data in your various siloed applications, unifying them and allowing them to work together to communicate and plan on your behalf and at your discretion. And I want to make a note here, because the Internet of You must be user permissioned and user opt-in before, I mean, I'm a privacy freak, but before all the privacy freaks, you know, freak out. Um, it's paramount for the Internet of You to be safe and secure in order for it to work. So, done right, your Internet of You will understand the real world context of every moment of your life. And based on that context, it will deeply know you. And with your own data driving the experiences, it will be able to serve you personalized offers, information, advice, ads, content that are customized and personalized just for you. It will be all about you. Now take this one step further. One day your internet of you will predict what you want before you even ask. Now, predicting what a user wants and proactively delivering them the most appropriate, the most relevant digital experiences is a complete sea change in technology. 
It is taking the internet to a whole new, unprecedented level. So by now, you're probably having ideas as like, oh my gosh, you know what this could look like, or you're wondering, what could this look like, right? So let's say that Starbucks knows your purchase history, knows that you get a chai latte every, work, every morning before work because of your purchase history. Now let's connect that purchase data to your calendar, to your location. Now your Starbucks app can preemptively say, good morning, Jeremy. We see you have a 9 a.m. meeting downtown. Would you like to pre-order chai latte from the Starbucks near there? Click here to order and click here to reroute. And as you're driving to pick it up, it sees your location and checks in with Waze or Google Maps for their traffic and realizes, uh-oh, you're going to be late. So it messages you, hey, Jeremy, would you like us to notify the other event participants, because it has the calendar invites, of your new ETA? And if Starbucks was really smart, They'd get the coffee orders of everyone else in the room with their credit cards and your permission and have those hot and ready for you to pick up. So now, now you're the hero, not the schmuck who came late, right? Your smart device that monitors your blood sugar can be connected to your medical history, to your food diary app, to your calendar, and it can preemptively say, hey, Bill, you should order something, you should get something to eat because you have back-to-back -back meetings the rest of the afternoon. And then it can wake up your Grubhub app or your Seamless Celeb app, which knows your food preferences and can continue. So, would you like to order some sushi now? The amount of services, information, advice, offers that can be delivered to you and are just about you are endless. This is truly personalized computing. Now, as each application developer comes, feeds into the internet of you, it gets smarter and smarter, richer and richer, more and more intelligent about you and your behaviors. So any new application provider that comes into it not only feeds into it, but also gets to take advantage of the entire and growing integrated ecosystem of hyper-personalized data. So what you do in any given moment through any of your apps or devices becomes part of a cumulative build towards greater and greater relevance about you and your behaviors, which in turn helps each and every member of the ecosystem understand you in a deeper and more meaningful way, which then enables them to deliver you engaging, rewarding, and extremely compelling digital experiences. So you win, the application providers win, the ecosystem wins, and you all continue on your relevant journey together. Now, without the ability to contextualize our data on an event-by-event, person-by-person level, we are left with personalizations and recommendations that are based on aggregate level demographics or psychographics. So what that means is you get personalizations and recommendations based on people like you, not based on you, not based on the actual context of your life. And this is the reality that we live in today. So I'm sure a lot of you are familiar with using big data right, very different than personal big data, using big data to aggregate it and get segments and cohorts, and then plopping a human being right on top of that and saying, oh, you know, this person must be like that demographic. Well, I am sure you've all gotten internet ads that are supposed to be personalized for you. I live in Manhattan, and I get these Facebook ads for female CEOs as if we're all the same, needing to take late helicopters to the Hamptons. I'd like to meet these female CEOs who take helicopters to the Hamptons. I'd like to be a female CEO who takes a I, Honestly, I would just like to take a helicopter to the Hamptons. We need the ability to reattach the context, the who, what, when, and where of our lives, to merge all this siloed data we are creating about our lives into a single network that learns who we are, grows with us, and provides us the best tools provides us the tools to be the best us that we can be, not somebody else's idea of us. Now, I founded the startup My Planet to do just this. We are fueling the internet of you by syncing in the data from your various disparate apps and devices into a single network. We then parse the data out from these silos and link them back together based on the context of, of time and place. We link them back together in a standardized, 
patented structure of data. Now we call this data, this structure, the geotemporal unit or the dot GTU. And it connects four elements, place and time from which it gets its name, geotemporal, and people and content, or the who, what, when, and where. So we parse out the who, what, when, and where fields from all these different silos and then link them back together based on place and time because that is real world context that people understand based on how our brains, right, how our hippocampi work. Now, well, together these pieces, these four pieces, make up what we call a moment, which is a human concept that is lost in today's technologies that focus on individual data silos or data bits. And I'll be talking about the power of humanizing data a little bit later. But companies think in individual data bits or data silos, and we humans, we think in moments. So the GTU is harmonizing data from disparate sources into a single moment, which means that we are standardizing different formats of data into a unified format. So the, one of the benefits of this standardization, and you guys see this here at RISO, is that it now um, enables, it becomes a shareable standard. So other apps and devices for the first time can trade GTUs so that they can talk to and plan with each other about your real world life. And just to be clear, the GTU, like the, a dot iCal is still a single focused format. So the key here is interconnected personal data. So one of the other benefits of the GTU is that we can quickly and easily append any kind of data to any one of those four axes. And internally, we actually call this the molecule, and each of those four circles are an atom. So let's look at the place atom. There is place metadata in your calendar. So have you ever thought about that, right? The, the event location, that's a where. And there's place metadata in your contacts, the home or work address of your folks, right? That's a where. And there's place metadata in four square venue information, store hours, tips, Place metadata in MLS data, Google Places, Wiki Travel. There's content, there's history about Buckingham Palace in Wiki Travel. Let's look at the who, Adam. There's obviously people data in your contacts. That's what contacts is all about. There's also people data in your calendar, right? The invitees. There's people data in your social media accounts and in your CRMs, like Boomtown and Salesforce. So just like RISO wants to be the common language of real estate data everywhere, we would like the GTU to be the common language of personal data everywhere. So this was actually a slide that Jeremy sent me, which is, and, and I think Craig talked about it before, or Chris, Chris talked about it before, on internet traffic, tracking. And this is really tracking your behavior online, right? We call it the virtual world or your online behavior, and it has very similar concepts. So the event is the when, it's the timestamp. The actor, in this case it's who, it's you, not somebody else, but still there's a who component. The object is the what, and the source is where it comes from, which is the where. Here it's a virtual where, right? So it's a virtual location versus your real world location. So the difference here is that this is um, tracking your virtual behavior. And what we're looking to do is understand your real world behavior and recreate that in a digital format. So by linking GTU to GTU, what you're really doing is linking a series of moments together which recreates the flow of life. And this is what it makes it so special. So, what does all of this have to do with real estate? <laughs> well, the context of who, what, when, and where is especially important to real estate. It's especially important to agents, right? They manage their careers based on who, what, when, and where. We all know great agents aren't at their desks. They're out in the field, scheduling, capturing, recording, who they took where, when, and what they did. They liked this kitchen. They hated that bathroom. And they have sophisticated methodologies for keeping track of all of this information. 
Now, we've been spending a lot of time with real estate professionals, and we got a peek into the proprietary methodologies that they use to manage all this information, and they gave me permission to share it with you here today. So are you ready to see it? <laughs> Does this look familiar? Anybody seen this? Yeah, right? They're using pen and paper, notebook, day planners, MLS printouts scattered in various folders. All this valuable data is dead data. It's not searchable, it's not functional, and it's almost impossible for our brains to synthesize from one page to the next. Now, there are agents that I spoke to who took their notebooks back to their office and they retyped them into Microsoft Word or Excel, so at least it was searchable. And they're the smart ones, because the woman who sent me the picture on the right, it took her five days to get me the photo because she lost her notebook. It wasn't backed up. And I say to agents and to brokers, do you know how much money you lose on each piece of paper, not to mention the sticky note that fell between the car seats? Now, agents are using digital tools, right, to record and to see where their showings and their opens and which client and who they took where, but they're, they're in siloed, disconnected applications. They're your contacts, your CRMs, there's your places, your maps, your MLS data, your photos, your videos, Evernote. None of these applications talk to each other. So now imagine how their careers, how their jobs would be transformed by the internet of you. So welcome to my planet. We make real estate personal. For agents, it does three things. It remembers your past, makes you smarter in the present, and helps plan your future. And for brokerages, MLSs, associations, we white label it. So let's talk about first how my planet helps you remember your past. Let me see if I can fast forward here. Ditch that notebook and enter your journey screen. Here we record, automatically record everything related to your field activities. So you just have to be at a home or a venue for five minutes or take a photo as you're driving by and we'll record where you were, when you arrived, and when you left. Now one of the biggest problems in real estate technology is the lack of integration. Well, my planet sinks in and interconnects the data from your places, your contacts, your calendar, your photos, videos, and notes. Now, my planet is a patented data platform with unlimited extensibility. So over time, we'll be able to connect data from additional sources, like CRM, public records, and anything else that is important to you. Now, let me just pause this. Now, my planet was designed to be as automated as possible. We like to call it easy peasy, lemon squeezy technology because we do 90% of the heavy lifting for you. So not only are we automatically journaling your activities, but we're syncing any changes that are made in my planet, we sync back to your other applications and vice versa. So if you add a calendar event into your native iPhone calendar, we'll bring it in. If you make an edit in people in my planet, we'll sync it back. It's minimal touch technology designed to eliminate your administrative burden. Now, we didn't just stop at interconnecting data. We also interconnect functionality. So from a single screen, you can get directions to a home and call, text, and email the listing agent or your client. And you can share your photos, notes, videos, and MLS data from one place. No more jumping from app to app. For the first time, everything you need is centralized in one application. Now, second, my planet makes you smarter in the present. So we always spoke about how connecting data makes it intelligent, and my planet connects data like our brains do, so it synthesizes your information for you. We've built the world's first visual search of your life, which means that you can search for your information based on how your brain works, right? Based on time and location. We were discussed that hippocampus is spatiotemporal recall. So you can see all the homes you've shown a specific client, here, Adam. Or you can see all the homes you showed him in a specific area. Or you can see all the homes you've shown him in a specific last week, last month, or last year. 
Or you can show him all the homes with kitchens that he liked. Whoops. So there was an NAR study that was done where they surveyed uh, home purchasers uh, five years after they bought their home. And they asked them, are you happy with your home? And they said yes. And then they asked them, were you happy with your agent? Yes. What's your agent's name? I don't remember. If leads is the first level of business for generation of sales for, for agents, referrals is the next level. With my planet, now all your information about each client will be automatically recorded, organized, centralized, stored, and readily accessible. So that way when you contact them, you remember who they are, what you did with them, and their preferences. Now, if you go to the Places tab, you can see by property every client you took to that home. So my planet cross-indexes everything so you forget nothing. And in tags, my planet keeps track of everything that's important to you, whether it's list of places like schools or great wine bars or people like attorneys and mortgage brokers. And all of it is searchable by time, location, and words. So now all your information is at your fingertips so you can prove you're the neighborhood expert. With a single tap, you can show a client all the homes you sold in the area that they're looking. And on the listing screen, you can see all the listings that match your client's preferences. And all of it is searchable by location, time, maybe you want to see listings that have been on the market for three months or more, and words. And the third thing is that my planet helps plan your future. So the client summary screen shows next steps with each client, whether it's an upcoming showing, a new listing, or an unread chat. And our upcoming in-app chat is not just text messaging. It's transactional or actionable communication. So with a single tap, you can share a listing directly in the chat. Or in your clients can say, ask to schedule or say meh. And now this is big. We have pulled everything together for easy access in a notification center called My Hub. My Hub gives you the information and tools you need to provide value immediately to your clients. So you can see your upcoming scheduled appointments, get directions to them, and communicate with the attendees. You can see your latest chats. And you can see new listings just on the market that match all your clients' preferences, that match your clients' preferences. And then MyPlanet aggregates all matched clients to that property. Tap on the listing, and you can communicate with each attendee. One's not interested, swipe to dismiss. Another one is, one tap to schedule an appointment. We pre-fill all the information. All you need to do is set the time and send. And this brings us back to the journey screen. Wake up in the morning and see your calendar events on a map with MLS data connected. And of course, you can get directions from one to the next without ever leaving the app. Like the best personal assistant, my planet knows you and thinks like you. So it minimizes your administrative time, streamlines your relationships, and helps improve your bottom line. We make real estate personal. Now, I'm going to switch gears and discuss a couple more things before wrapping this up. So we just saw how connecting data, linking it, linking an agent's data and an individual's data is powerful for them. But think about your enterprise level systems, right? And how you have data and data fields in all your different applications, property data, billing data, people data. And think about what would happen if you were to connect them. Remember, connecting data is powerful. So how many of you have ever heard of Sir Tim Berners-Lee? Raise your hand few of you. Okay. 
So Tim Berners-Lee is the founder of the World Wide Web, which I spoke about before. It's a portion of the internet. It's not the entire internet. Um, and the World Wide Web, what it is, is it's a bunch of linked documents, right? It's a web page, which is an actual document linked to another document. Well, in 2009, Tim Berners-Lee gave a TED Talk about the power of linking data together. And what he wants to do is link data bits in the web document together. And I'm going to play a snippet of his TED Talk, which is called The Semantic Web, if any of you want to look it up. And he discusses the power of linking data in different genres of data. And if you pay close attention, you will hear and see where he talks about linking personal data together. They get to look at all the data and they get it connected together. And the really important thing about data is the more things you have to connect together, the more powerful it is. So linked data, the meme went out there. And pretty soon, Chris Bitzer at the Freie Universität in Berlin who was one of the first people to put interesting things up. He noticed that Wikipedia, you know Wikipedia, the online encyclopedia with lots and lots of interesting documents in it. Well, in those documents, there are little squares little boxes and those in those information boxes there's data so he wrote a program to take the data extract it from wikipedia and put it into a blob of linked data on the web which he called dbpedia dbpedia is represented by the blue blob in the middle of this slide and if you actually go and look at berlin you'll find that there are other blobs of data which also have stuff about berlin and they're linked together so if you pull the data from dbpedia about berlin you'll end up pulling up these other things as well. And the exciting thing is it's starting to grow. This is just the grassroots stuff again, OK? Now let's think about data for a bit. Data comes, in fact, in lots and lots of different forms. Think of the diversity of the web. It's a really important thing that the web allows you to put all kinds of data up there. So it is with data. I could talk about all kinds of data. We could talk about government data. Enterprise data is really uh, important. There's scientific data, there's personal data, there's weather data, there's data about events, there's data about talks and there's news, and there's all kinds of stuff. There are data in every aspect of our lives, every aspect of work and pleasure, okay? And it's not just about the number of places where data comes, it's about connecting it together. And when you connect data together, you get power in a way that doesn't happen just with the web, with documents, you get this really huge power out of it. Okay. So if there's one point that I want you to remember from this talk, it's that connecting data is powerful. And so you can hopefully already know, see that I'm really into the brain. And when you repeat something, when you remind something, you're creating a stronger and stronger neural network. So I'm going to ask you guys to humor me. And please repeat after me. Don't leave me standing here like with all quiet and looking at your laptops. I see you guys. Um, <laughs> to repeat after me, um, connecting, on the count of three, connecting data is powerful. So you ready? One, two, three. Connecting data is powerful. Thank you. That's awesome. OK. So I want to leave you with a thought on the big picture. The ultimate goal for any of us in the technological age is to humanize all this data that we're creating not only about us, but about our clients and our customers also. We have entered a me, me, me generation. Consumers are expecting a personalized customer experience. In fact, nine out of 10 customers said that a personalized experience influenced their purchase decision. And companies are getting the message loud and clear. Accenture did a technology vision report a couple years ago called the Internet of Me. And 81% of organizations surveyed said that the personalized customer experience is in their top three priorities for their entire organization. And almost 40% said that it was their number one priority. Now, on Riso's website, it says that real estate brokers today know that data is also their destiny. And hopefully today you now have a better understanding of how data is also the destiny and future of all of us on an individual level and also a consumer, a customer level. And real estate has always been an incredibly personalized service. And for those of you whose end customer is the client, is the consumer, um, you know, personaliz personalization has normally been done by spending time with your client to get to know them. 
but increasingly, your ability to differentiate yourself and your brand will depend also on leveraging technology to understand the digital footprint of your customers so that you can deliver them even more personalized services and predictive ones, not only during the purchasing, the home purchasing and um, selling experience, but continuing to serve them afterwards so that you and your brand always remain top of mind when it comes time to referring you to their friends, families, and colleagues. So connecting all this data and accessing it in a way where that, where that mimics how our brains, where how our brains process this information is a way of humanizing all this data. And to show you the power, the humanizing power of data, we built something for Alexa's, for Amazon's Alexa. And I'm going to show you a video of it. And in it, you'll also actually see our general consumer app that we launched in January at Inman. And it's free. If you guys are on iPhones, you can download it from the App Store. By leveraging our technology, we were able to help Alexa mimic human memory. Alexa, ask my planet how many times did I work out in February 2017? You had 11 workouts between Wednesday, February 1, 2017 and Wednesday, March 1, 2017. Alexa, ask my planet when was the last time I had a migraine? The last time you had a migraine was four months ago on Saturday. November 12, 2016. We are My Planet. My Planet is a mobile app that works in the background and captures your real world life as you move across time and place. The app automatically records where you've been and when you were there. Our personal data platform links the when and where to actions, we call those the what's, you did while you were there, and to people, the who's, you were there with by interconnecting data from your calendar, contacts, photos, and notes. Over time, we'll be able to link more and more info to the who, what, when, and where of your life. That information can come from other apps like your social networks, your wearables, the weather, or even from your e-wallet. When we connect the who, what, when, and where, we create context, which is what the hippocampus in the human brain uses for recall. And when we connect that context to Alexa, we've recreated human memory. Alexa, ask my planet what was the name of the hotel that I went to with Adam Jacobs in 2016 in Carlsbad? You went to Omni La Costa Resort and Spa on Wednesday, July 13, 2016. Would you like to call or get directions to Omni La Costa Resort and Spa in my planet? Yes, call. Calling Omni La Costa Resort and Spa. And this is what happens real time on our app. Alexa, ask my planet what was the name of the Japanese restaurant that I went to with Kevin Conroy in 2016 in New York? You went to Nobu 57 on Thursday, September 1st, 2016. Would you like to call or get directions to Nobu 57 in my planet? Yes, get directions. Getting directions to Nobu 57. Haha. <laughs> Ask my planet what was the name of the bottle of wine I had with Jeff Young in Tribeca last summer. I need Amazon to partner with my planet to answer that question. And, bonus, my planet will enable the user to order that wine from Amazon Prime. Ka-ching. <laughs> So, as personal data becomes ubiquitous and democratized, layered on top of computing and networking, it will touch off the most spectacular technology explosion yet. 
An entire new generation of services will run in the background, be with you, and add value to your daily flow, activities, and experiences. The companies that succeed in this internet of you will become the next generation of household names. Big data doesn't even begin to describe the enormity of what is coming next, and it's going to be all about you. Thank you.